So Patrick Lips Houlihan, I had 27 years in the Marine Corps. I did 12 active, about 15 reserves. Did four deployments, um, was instructor pilot of the year, and was very fortunate and blessed to have been selected and to have actually graduated from the United States Navy Fighter Weapons School Top Gun. So I had a great career. By the way, when you thank me for your service, uh, I'm going to thank you for your tax dollars because I burned a lot of them up uh, throughout my career. So thank you. By the way, these jokes are going to keep coming and they're not going to get any better. So just keep laughing, all right? Um, but I finished up as a chief of staff. I went to the Army War College. And while I was in San Diego in my reserve time, I also worked for Toys for Tots, so another uh, great organization and charity. By the way, Reverend, my father is a Vietnam uh, vet. So thank you for your service and what you do for his fellow uh, brothers and sisters that served in that conflict. Um, so what else have I done? Well, when I left active duty, I ventured out into the civilian world. I was a director of seminars. I've been an account manager, I've been a director of business development and an executive or an organizational development executive. I've also have a little entrepreneurial spirit and I've been a part of a couple startups. One crashed and burned heroically. It was a great big fireball. It was an absolute train wreck, but I learned a lot from that. Um, and the other two, they're going along pretty well. We'll see where they end up at the end of the day. So I have some experience and a lot of those things that I learned at Top Gun really did translate or transfer out into the civilian world as well. One of the first questions I often get is, how did you get into flying, right? What, what makes somebody want to go be a fighter pilot? Well, I had a very normal childhood. I actually grew up just down the river. Well, not this river, but the other river. I grew up in Jackson, Mississippi. I moved there when I was seven, left when I was 16, moved to Kansas City, that's me. At St. Richard's grade school, I think I'm in fifth grade there. I'm mean mugging that camera. Look at that face, right? Um, but uh, I lived in the Pearl River, which is why I never get sick. Yeah, that was probably not the best move of my life, but uh, my antibodies are way up here. Um, but I had a normal childhood, wrecked bikes, built fires, built forts, you know, ran around as a little kid. Uh, when it was time to go to college, I actually followed followed where my father went. I went to the Citadel, the Military College of South Carolina. And when I went there, there were three things I wanted to do. I wanted to play football. I wanted to be a professional football player. But when I got there, I figured out that I'm just a step, well, maybe two steps, too slow. I'm about four inches too short, 20 pounds too light. So those career aspirations went away. I love animals. I thought, you know what, I'm going to be a veterinarian. And then I got this, something like microbiology or something like that. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> that ain't going to work. So I went for my third choice, which was to go fly jets. You know, I like setting a low bar, uh, apparently. Um, and I was very blessed. When I went into the Marine Corps, I actually went in as a ground officer. I was either going to be an infantry officer or drive tanks. But I, I guess I did well enough, and they sent me off to flight school. So this is a picture of me having just returned from the USS John F. Kennedy after landing on the ship for the first time. Um, you can see that I brought your taxpayer-funded piece of equipment back safely, so that was good. Um, big smile on my face because that was the most unique experience I've ever had. Um, landing on an aircraft carrier, who's been in a car accident? Not, not that I want to talk about something, tra that's what it's like landing on an aircraft carrier. You literally are crashing the airplane onto the, uh, the deck of the aircraft carrier. Um, the cat shots off the front are a hoot. They're the funnest thing you could ever imagine. It's the best roller coaster ride you could ever experience. The next question I often get is, you know, why are you ever scared? You know, I, I mean, it's a pretty dynamic environment. And yeah, there was a couple times flying an airplane where I actually had the opportunity to sit there and think about my own mortality, to actually sit there and think about, I could die right now. And that first instance was actually landing on the USS Abraham Lincoln. So, some enterprising individual, I'm very fortunate to have this video because, or this photo because I did not go back to the ship after my initial training, but this is me landing on the uh, Ronald Reagan. Now, during the day, it's not that bad of a deal. So the bottom left-hand picture is what it looks like or the inside of the F-18 cockpit. Lots of buttons and switches, you figure that stuff out. The middle picture there, if everybody remembers the first Top Gun movie, where at the beginning they're like, Maverick, call the ball. That's what, it's about three quarters of a mile behind the ship. It's not that bad, that's what it looks like. It's a little daunting that you're gonna put a 
$30 million, 26,000 pound airplane on that. Um, and then the top right is what it looks like right when you're about to land. And oh, by the way, there is the ball right there in the center. So a little orange light you put just above the green lights, line up on center line and land. Don't let anybody tell you being a fighter pilot's hard. It's really just do that and you could land a, an airplane on the ship. That's the daytime. This is what it looks like at night, okay? And if I could blank out the room and take away every light in this room, it is a very daunting thing. You have, your, your vision is about 3.3 degrees. Your balance and your awareness in the world comes from your peripheral vision. On the ship, at night, in the ocean, in the weather, under the clouds, with no cultural lighting, no stars or moon, that is gone. It's the weirdest experience on the world that all of a sudden you have nothing and you're relying solely on your instruments. The bottom left-hand picture, I turned every light up in the airplane just to show I was in an airplane. That middle picture, I don't know who took that. Um, I certainly wouldn't have done that. But that's about that three quarters of a mile. And then the top right-hand picture is what it looks like uh, when you're landing on the ship. So my first experience landing on the boat, I approached it. I never touched it. I went back up into the clouds. And if my mother heard the string of words I put together, I would have been eating Tide for a month. But when I came back behind the ship, because all fighter pilots have to sound cool on the radio, I'm sitting here screaming at myself, a, you know, shooter 2-1, call the ball. Shooter 2-1, Roger Ball, 7.5. Oh, my God, what am I doing here? But I, I actually made it. But it was, a, it was a very scary factor, but I had a lot of good instructors. Um, who got me there. And I learned a lot from those instructors, not just as a student, but as a uh, Top Gun graduate as well. Before I go any further, I know we had some veterans raise their hands. Who was in the Army? Uh, Army? Okay. Thank you, gentlemen. Appreciate it. Um, who was in the Air Force? Okay. Two, I'm surprised you guys aren't golfing right now. Who was in the Navy? Okay, Navy? Sir, thank you for taking us around the world back there as well. Any Coasties in the room? Oh, we got a Coastie. I, I don't often get Coasties in the room, so thank you. My, my uh, cousin was 20, 28 years in the Coast Guard. Where are my Marines? Any Marines? All right. By the way, happy birthday. By the way, Friday was Veterans Day. The day before that was the most important day on the face of the earth. It was the Marine Corps' birthday. And if you don't know the history behind the Marine Corps, we were founded in a bar. So that should tell you enough about that. All right, so let's continue on about some of these lessons. So the next question is, how do you get into Top Gun? What is the selection criteria? Now, everybody says you're the best of the best. And you know what? I was, I was a good pilot. I was a competent. I mean, I wasn't the best of the best. I could sit in a room and any given day go, you know what? He's better. She's better. Or on any given mission, someone could be better. I think the reason why I got to Top Gun was because of well, how I interacted with my team. And I want to thank my parents for that because that's where it began. Both my mom and dad were captains in the Marine Corps. Um, so I was, always had a, you know, a, a thought process or, or teaching of service. Always give back. Always set your people up for success. Always look out for them first. And I think that just carried through. So in my squadron, it wasn't about me. It was about everybody else. And based on that, I got to go to Top Gun. And I'm not talking about this one. That's a bad joke, so we'll just skip over that one. But I'm talking about this one, the United States Navy Fighter Weapons School. Now, when I went to Top Gun, they had moved it from Miramar up to Fallon, Nevada. Um, and it was an experience sitting in that room the first time going, what am I doing here? And when are they going to figure it out? Right? But there are a lot of cool things that I learned. And the first one I want to talk about today is having a purpose. We walk in, we sit in an auditorium, a guy named Marvin, he's a student control officer, one of the Top Gun instructors. He walks in the room and he says, gentlemen, now when I went, we had an all Marine class, which means we did nothing but torture our Navy instructors. Um, and we had an all male class. So when I tell the story, it's all gentlemen, but plenty of women have gone through Top Gun and been very successful as well. But we sit down and he goes, gentlemen, the commanding officer has something to say. We all stand up, he walks to the front of the room, we all sit down and he says, gentlemen, we are here to teach the teachers. And that was it. That's how we started. Now, I know everybody thinks about, oh, what's Top Gun? And we go back to this. Gentlemen, you are the top 1% of all naval aviators, the best of the best. We'll make you better. Everybody remember that scene in the first? 
Viper's walking down, he turns around, and then they're talking about where the trophy goes and everything else. Top Gun actually has a mission statement, like most organizations do. And I'll read this to you. The United States Navy Fighter Weapons School Top Gun Strike Fighter Tactics and Course, SFTI, produces graduate level strike fighter, tacticians, adversary instructors, and air intercept controllers, AIC, who go on to fill the assignment. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, not very inspiring. It does describe everything, but this leveled the playing field. Because after he said, we're here to teach the teachers, he turned around and said, we're gonna give you the best tactics, the latest training, the best information, and it's your responsibility to go back to your bases, your ships, and your squadrons, and teach everybody else. And in that moment, when he said, we're here to teach the teachers, I knew what it meant to wear that patch. And I remember seeing those other Top Gun graduates when I was a young captain, or Air Force Fighter Weapons School graduates, or Marine Air Weapons Tactics School. They're just different. And I'm sitting there going, I'm about to become one of those individuals. And at the end of the day, my job is to teach everybody else. And not just pilots, teach my Marines, my enlisted Marines as well, and make sure that they're set up for success. And it really changed the dynamic. The point that I'm trying to get across is when you think about what your organization does, what you do, it's just not you sell widgets or you sell insurance or you run a bank. What is it that you do? What does City Current do? You power the good. Why? Because it helps people, right? It helps Memphis. It gives people a, a, a great outlook, a future hope. Think about what your organization does and communicate that to everyone on your team because that is the great equalizer and that is what makes the difference. A couple of examples from some recent organizations I worked with. Newman Carriers are a trucking company up in Illinois. Just do the right thing. United, uh, U.S. medical equipment, movable medical equipment. Anything in a hospital room that can be moved, that's what they service. And it was funny, I asked them what they do. and Well, we service equipment. I go, no, what do you really do? Well, you know, we, we rent equipment. I go, what do you really do? And someone in the back of the room says, we save lives. And they do. They provided, during COVID, all the ventilators and respirators at hospitals and organizations, the beds, that they were out there literally on the front lines making sure that those organizations had that. And they had, I mean, these guys don't have any medical training. They didn't have the right PPE, but they were showing up. They were saving lives. So think about what your organization does and communicate that to the team because it does make a difference. The second thing I learned at Top Gun was this, dedication. My Navy, I, where's my Navy? Navy folks, sir, what, what did you do in the Navy? Okay, were you on ship then? All right, so when you go on a ship, when you go on deployment, usually they're six months, maybe eight months long. Um, sometimes they're longer, but there's also the workup periods, which is another six months. So if you're on a ship, especially with an aircraft carrier group, literally you could be gone at sea for a year, continuously, not home, away from your significant other, away from your children, away from everything. I mean, you'll miss all, you'll miss all of kindergarten. Your child will go through all of kindergarten, you will not have been there. It's Friday evening. We've had a very long week. We were there at six o'clock in the morning. It's about 8.30 at night. The 10 of us are in our little student room. We're done studying, our heads start, and we're like, okay, let's go to the O Club. We'll get a uh, pizza couple beers and then we'll be back here nine o'clock the next morning to do it again. And as we leave the room, we're walking down the hallway and it's so late that it's one of those times where the lights flicker on, right? Because no one has been in the building for a long time. And as we walk by that auditorium, that light is on and we hear a voice and we file into the back of the room, kind of just, you know, sidestep it in and we look at it and there's an instructor and he's delivering a lecture with slides and he's picking up models and he's teaching a completely empty room. He gives us a quick head nod, finishes up his lecture. We go, what are you doing? He says, well, in two weeks, I have a murder board. Now, what a murder board is at Top Gun, before an instructor ever gets in front of a student in a flight, a brief, a simulator, they have to do that in front of the instructor staff. And the instructor staff sits there and writes down every little tiny mistake they make. They basically murder their presentation. That's why they call it a murder board. 
And I'm standing there listening to this guy. Now, it's not Monday he's doing this. It's two weeks out. Now, as a pilot at Top Gun, as an instructor, this guy just came off the ship. He just came off two successive or two back-to-back -back deployments. And instead of being at home with his kids and his wife, he's in here delivering a brief to an empty room for me. For me. And I dawned on me, why would I ever not do the same? Dedication, not just to your business. I mean, I know most people are like, yes, show up. I mean, Elon Musk, right? He's telling everybody, you're all showing up at six and you're never leaving now. <laughs> and everybody's panicking. Um, it's not about that. It's, it's when you show up, show up. Whether it's volunteering, whether it's at your organization, you're not showing up just to make the dollar. You're showing up for your brothers and sisters to your left and right and for the person that you're affecting at the end of the day. Having that type of dedication levels the playing field. And from a competitive business standpoint, you'll crush your competition. From a philanthropy standpoint, you will really, really make a difference if you're present and you show up every single day. And that's what they did at Top Gun. And when I became an instructor, um, that's just how I conducted myself. And it really made a difference. I, I could see it and I would ask my students later on, how did we do? And they're like, no, you guys showed up, you did well. And that's, that's the whole part about that dedication piece. The next step, or the next thing I learned was humility and honesty. Now it's very interesting, let's think about this. If you're the top 1% to go to Top Gun, what, is that, what are you if you're a Top Gun instructor? Anybody wanna do the math on that? I'm not doing, I mean, you have gotta be really, really good, right? What was interesting is that when we asked a question, it was never Lips recommends or Marvin recommends, it was always Top Gun recommends. Even though they were the, literally the best pilots in the world, it wasn't about them. It was about the organization. It was about the mission of the organization. That's what took priority. The other thing was honesty. Now, if you're the best of the best, you should probably know everything, right? If you're the best athlete, you're the best, uh, you're the CEO, you're the, pre if you're the VP, you should know everything about your business. Well, same with Top Gun instructors. But what's interesting is that if we asked a question and they did not know the 100% right answer, they would never give us a half truth. They would never make something up. They look us in the eye and they go, you know what, that's a good question. I don't know, I'll go find out. Every single time they did that. And then what do you think they did? This is audience participation right here, right? Yeah, they went and found out, right? And then they came back and told us. And now it got to a point because we were Marines, we're like, all right, we're gonna stump the instructor. So we would actually get in the books and try to come up with the most obscure question right, which I guess inadvertently had us learn more. Um, and we, but they would always go find out. They would bring the subject matter expert in to the next thing. They conferenced, one time they conferenced in someone from a super secret squirrel location in DC to give us the answer um, because of the question that we asked. But they always went and found out. Interestingly enough, if I'm ever dealing with anyone in a business aspect, the second they go, you know what, I don't know, but I'll go find out, or something along that, and they're honest, hey, I'm breaking out the checkbook, you just bought me. I will do business with you every single day of the week. It is an important thing as a leader and as a professional, and if you don't know, don't give a false answer. And it's okay, it's okay to be human. It's okay to go, you know what, even though I got all the patches and flight time, I don't know. But I'll go find out and then get back with the answer. The next thing uh, that came out of Top Gun was this, tough love. It's week seven, Top Gun's a 12 week course. I mean, we have been busting our tails and I'm in a debrief. Marvin actually was, was the, the, the instructor on that flight. We're watching my tapes, it's going okay. And then he stops my tapes and he looks down at the ground, takes a deep breath and he looks at me straight in the eye and he says, Lips, if you don't straighten out your short range radar, you're not gonna graduate. We don't have the time. You're not meeting the standard. There's a standard we have to keep. And if you don't fix this, you're done. And you gotta fix it by tomorrow. Now, I about fell out of my chair. You know, I thought the light that was at the end of the tunnel was, was the ending, right? And now it turned out to be a, a locomotive that just ran me over. What's interestingly enough is I went and a crew served. We, we, had two, we had single seat airplanes and we had two seat airplanes. So if I failed, 
Even though we're evaluated individually, what do you think that was going to do my backseater? Yeah, he was going to fail too because this part of the flight was my responsibility. And imagine that. The Marine Corps sent two airplanes, 20 Marines, who spent all that money, selected me over a host of a bunch of other people, and now I got to turn around and go home and say, sorry, boss, I didn't make it. I mean, all of that was going through my head. But you know what? I appreciated that tough love because what it really meant was that Marvin cared. He cared enough to be mature enough, right, to look at me in the eye and go, dude, you're not, you're not cutting it right now. And then after he said that, what do you think he did next? He helped me do it. Two and a half hours we spent in the simulator going over this phase of flight over and over and over and over again. I don't know what he else he had going on. I don't know what other meetings he had, other flights. I mean, he basically scrubbed his schedule and went, you know what? You, this mission, this school is important enough. I'm going to put in the time. I can get to all that other stuff. And we went through it over and over and over again. Now, the flight was the next day. Yeah, I did really well on it. Um, I did very well on that, that portion of the flight. What's interesting was upon graduation, I went up to him. I said, Marvin, just out of curiosity, were you serious when you said you weren't going to let me graduate? And he looked at me and he goes, oh, yeah. And his expression did not change. I was like, OK. I go, did, did you like watch my tapes or did you talk to crew? Was the guy who I flew with? He goes, oh, yeah. We sat down and we went through your tapes over and over again to make sure you were doing it right. There is nothing wrong with tough love. There is nothing wrong with leveling the playing field for somebody. The worst thing you could have is someone sitting there going, I didn't know I was doing something wrong. I didn't know I had any shortcut. Why didn't, why didn't anybody help me? I mean, as an individual, why didn't you care enough to help me get to where I needed to go? You can do it with dignity and respect, you can, and then help that person out. But sometimes you do need to level the playing field. And it was a poignant lesson that I pulled through my whole career, and I used plenty of times with my students. Hey, this is where you need to be. Let me go help you.